567. Here I am to worship. So may our worship, if it hasn't already started, start with this. 567. our Lord and Savior. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the first Sunday after Christmas in this family worship service here at Trinity. Welcome to you all. It's a different sight to see. At the 5 p.m. and the 8 p.m. service, there were more than 300 people in the sanctuary. <laughs> and here today we have this remnant gathered together traveling and away. Very joyful worship service. I'm so glad you all are here today. This is going to be a wonderful time as we gather together in community to worship Jesus Christ. The last Sunday of the month is family worship, which means all ages are invited to participate in worship today. Even my little one, who's 19 months old, she'll be in the sanctuary today. There's no uh, caregivers in the nursery today or any classes. So children of all ages are welcome to worship. And for families, each of the pews, there is a guide to worship for families. So if you're interested in learning more about what is going on in the, all of the worship service, why do we do what we do, you can take a look inside of there. And also if you see little ones fidgeting or moving around, there's a wonderful little book nook on and they're, it's equipped with these wonderful uh, fidget activities so that they can be silent but remain present in worship and have a kinesthetic, tangible experience while they're here in worship. So you can always let people know that they're very welcome to participate throughout worship and direct them to that space over there. As I said, today's the first Sunday after Christmas, so we're going to continue with Christmas theme. 
for today's worship service. So I invite you to rise now in body or spirit, and we will sing some Christmas hymns together. Oh, last thing I forgot to mention, I'm sorry. Uh, We do not have screens for today's worship service, so we will be singing with our hymnals in our hands. So the hymnals are the red books in the pews in front of you. Please take them out. And our first hymn, I know, Christian doesn't even know what a a hymnal is, but the red book contains the hymns that we sing in the life of the church together. So grab that for our first hymn. What's the first hymn we're singing? 80, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. Let's, Let's worship the Lord together. Let's sing. joy to the world. The Lord has come. We are going to be called into worship in, with one of the Alleluia Psalms, but I need to invite you to help me out and take the Bible that's in the pew rack in front of you, and right in the middle of the thick of that uh, is the Psalms, the book of Psalms, and I invite you to turn to Psalm 148. And when you get there, it's on page 582 you will see that this psalm ends with praise the Lord, exclamation mark. So we're going to say that all together, praise the Lord, exclamation mark, at the beginning and the end. We're not going to say exclamation mark, but we're going to exclaim. And then we're going to alternate back and forth. So I will do the odd number verses, and you will do the even number verses as we are in this Alleluia psalm. You ready? All right, so together, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him in all the nations. Praise him in all the stars. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Praise 
mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well done. Now the other book that's in your uh, pew rack, which is the hymnal, there are two songs, 518, and then flip those last two numbers, 581. So why don't you put your finger in both of those, and when you're ready, you can stand up and we're going to sing.
standing, turn to 86. That is going to be the next hymn that we sing, Away in a Manger, 86. And once you've found that, I'm going to read our Old Testament lesson, which is Isaiah 63, verses 7 through 9. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior in all their distress it was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Jesus Christ be with you. Normally we pass the peace of Christ, but this morning I'd like us to pass the gift of Christ and just to think about what was it that was a gift for you this Christmas. It could have been a simple thing like sleep. Um, it could have been a hard thing like a conversation that you didn't want to have but turned out to be important. Uh, for me, it was hospitality. People opened their homes in a gracious and generous way, so that was the gift of Christmas for me. So turn to those around you. Pass the gift of Christmas. Share one thing that was a gift for you this Christmas.
Can I have all the children come on down for the children's message? There may be only a few children can come on down for the children's message. Hi, Emily. Come here. All the children come on down for the children's <laughs> message. That's okay. He can keep reading. It looks like we only have a few of us. That's fine. It's part of the, it's part of the order of worship, so we're still going to have a children's message, all right? Well, good morning. It's nice to see you all. And um, so for today's children's message, I wanted to ask you all a little question. Since it's family worship, you can do an activity during the sermon, okay? So I was going to show you the activity, and then maybe you can, you, you can participate by doing the activity, okay? The activity is to make little ornaments, and on the ornaments, it has different names on it. This one says Alpha and Omega. So in the Bible, Jesus has a lot of names. He, he, has, he has one name. We call him Jesus Christ, but he has a lot of nicknames like Alpha and Omega, which means the first and the last, or the beginning and the end. He has a lot of different nicknames. And he has all these different nicknames because he has a lot of different meanings for each of us, right? We experience something that we're thankful for from God for a bunch of different reasons. To share a story about your name, maybe, um, but there's only one of you. So, Evie, do you have a story behind how you got your name or why you, why you have the name that you have? No? You don't know? Okay. Well, apparently my, my thought process for the children's message isn't going to work today, but that's fine. So um, I will encourage you to make a few ornaments if you'd like to, okay? There's a bunch of different names on there. And while you're listening to the sermon, I'm going to be talking about today about how Jesus is our rescuer. That's another nickname that we talk about Jesus sometimes, how he rescues us, okay? So I'm going to say a prayer for us, and then I invite you. You can grab a packet if you want to, too, okay? And so can your brother. You can take one to your brother, too, if you'd like to, all right? So let me say a prayer for you, and then you can go back to your seats and help make some of the ornaments. God, thank you for the children of this church, Lord, for the ones who are here this day, but God, we also give you thanks for the ones who are away this day as well. We know that there's so many people who are part of this church community, and I pray, Lord, that wherever they may be this day, God, that your spirit would be with them, that they would know you, and that they would have an experience of the gift that comes at Christmas time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, children, you are dismissed to the activity, and you can take a packet with you if you like to, too, okay? All right. Well, this is actually great um, that the little children's message, you know, it, it was what it was. Um, <laughs> I have something in pastoral ministry, so I've been a pastor for seven or eight years, and something that adults often say to me is that I often get more out of a children's message than I do the sermon itself sometimes when I come to worship. Today may not be one of those days. <laughs> um, however, I've often heard that feedback, that sometimes I get more out of a children's message than I do out of the sermon itself. And so I thought, what if today on this kind of unique day in which uh, we worship in the middle of vacation time, I did a children's message for adults today for the sermon. So I'm going to sit on the stool like I'm sitting on the floor with the kids. We're all going to be sitting together, and I'm going to approach today's sermon as if it were a children's sermon, so to speak, which is... I will have some interactive questions for you to ponder, to think about, to talk with each other, to reflect on, and I'm going to tell a lot of stories today during this sermon time. So 
I will open us up with some scripture, and then I will pray for us. I'm going to read to us from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. This is part of the lectionary text, and this is in the church season, the first Sunday after Christmas. And this is the text that's part of the lectionary. I'm going to read to you from the message translation. And for those of you who are familiar with the message translation or unfamiliar with it, it was translated by Eugene Peterson, who was a longtime Presbyterian pastor. But he was a first-rate scholar for many years prior to becoming a pastor. He studied the Hebrew text, and he knew... Aramaic and Syriac. He knew a bunch of old ancient languages. And so he was an excellent scholar when he translated this into more contemporary English for us. So I want you just to enjoy listening to the message, and then I'll open us up with a word of prayer. So listen to God's word. It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer perfect through suffering as he leads all these people to glory. Since the one who saves and those who are saved have a common origin, Jesus doesn't hesitate to treat them as family, saying, I'll tell my good friends, my brothers and sisters, all I know about you. I'll join them in worship and praise to you. Again, he puts himself in the same family circle when he says, even I live by placing my trust in God. And yet again, I'm here with the children God gave me. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then, when he came before God as a high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. This is the gift of God's word. Join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So at this holiday time of the year, one of the things I love doing, and I wonder if you love doing this too, is watching movies. Are any of you watching good movies right now? Um, I love getting to watch a movie. This week I got to go see a movie in the movie theater for the first time in two years. Because <laughs> I have a little kid. It's really hard to go see a movie when you have a little child. I got to see a movie this week and I was so excited to go to a real movie theater and watch a real movie. It was, it was a great experience. Um, but I have a nostalgia for watching films around Christmas time. I remember in 2003 when I was a freshman in college, my brother and I went to go see the Lord of the Rings movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, which is a truly amazing cinematic experience. And it seems like good movies often come out around this time of the year too, where you look forward to it, you're hoping for it, you're expecting it. So I saw a few head nods. Some of you enjoy watching movies this time of the year. I've been doing a little bit of research too, just thinking about the impact of film and story. And in this past decade, from 2010 until now, the top 10 superhero films grossed more than $15 billion in sales. Isn't that incredible? That's an amazing, astonishing dollar amount, it seems to me. $15 billion, just the top 10 superhero films. Uh, the number one was, I can't remember what it was called, I didn't watch it, but for my friends who know the Marvel films, it was the, it was the one that came out last year, it was the big one. And that was almost $2 billion in ticket sales. Something about this says to me that we love a good story. We love a good hero story. We love watching a good film like this. And at this time of the year where we have a little bit more time in our schedule, we can invest in a good story and watching a good movie together. So here's the question I want to ask to you all. 
who are some of your favorite superheroes and why? And if you don't have a favorite superhero, that's okay. Maybe just a hero. What's, what's a good film in which, or a good book in which you go, oh, I love this person. This, this is a person who is a hero to me. So take one minute, turn to the people next to you, and I want you just to talk to them. Who is your favorite superhero and why? And if you don't have a favorite superhero film or a superhero, that's okay. Uh, what's another story in which you love a hero, a good hero and a good story? Okay, turn to your neighbors, introduce yourself, say hello, and, and talk to them for just a minute about that. And if you need to move to join someone, talk to them. Go for it. Okay, just 30 more seconds or so. Just another 30 seconds. All right. Who, who's willing to just shout out a couple of superheroes? Who are some favorite superheroes? Or heroes? Either one, yeah. Harriet from Harriet Tubman, a good hero. Okay. Other superheroes. Black Widow. Okay. Fred Rogers. Yeah, a hero. Absolutely. A true Presbyterian hero. No, absolutely. That's a good one. Other, other superheroes or heroes that we love? The Lone Ranger. Oh, yeah. Okay. Who? Pope Francis? Okay. The two popes. Okay. What? I heard another one back there. Okay. Who? Dr. Shivano. I don't... <laughs> I don't know who that is. Captain America. Yeah, these are great, great superheroes. Great heroes. Yeah, I've been watching Harry Potter this week, too. What else would you say? Wonder Woman. There's a new Wonder Woman coming out. I saw that in the theater, or the, the preview this week in the theater, 1984. That should be a good movie. So as I've been thinking about these stories this week, and I've been thinking about Lord of the Rings a lot. Like I said, I saw the first Lord of the Rings on Christmas. All the movies came out three years apart on Christmas, at uh, Christmas time. And I love going to watch these movies. I love reading the Lord of the Rings books. They're some of my favorite stories. I don't know if any of you have read them. They're so good. They're excellent books. J.R.R. Tolkien was a professor of philology at Oxford University. Philology is the study of language. Yeah, we don't even have this as a major in our universities, okay? Nobody majors in philology anymore. Um, but that's what he was. He, he loved language, and he loved good stories. And when J.R.R. Tolkien analyzed what made for a good story and a good hero story is he made up a new term, as a philologist would. He made up this new term. He called it, every good story needs two things, he said. He said, you need to have a catastrophe and you need to have a you catastrophe. A catastrophe is that moment in the story at which everything feels like it's falling apart, everything is going away, all the good things you think are supposed to happen in the story is about to fall apart and evaporate. And then in a moment, everything turns upside down and a you catastrophe happens. You meaning E-U, as in good. It, the Greek that comes from good, he adds this prefix to the word so that it turns the catastrophic moment upside down and things are resolved and you have this experience of joy when you participate in being in a good story or a good film or a good book. So when you think about the Lord of the Rings, for those of you that know the story, um, the hero of the story is not quite a superhero. He's a, he's a little person, Frodo Baggins. He's only three feet, eight inches tall. He doesn't look like a superhero compared to the other superheroes that some of us have mentioned. But some of the heroes you mentioned don't appear to be heroes as well. And yet, at the very moment when Frodo Baggins gets to Mount Doom and he's going to destroy the one ring that rules them all and restore balance to the Middle Earth. He's going to take care of evil once and for all. 
uh, this catastrophic moment happens when he's at Mount Doom. Does anybody remember this moment in the book or in the films? Instead of destroying the ring, when he finally gets to Mount Doom, he puts the ring on himself, and he is himself succumbed to the powers of darkness and Sauron. It's this horrible moment in the film. You think we've spent nine hours watching these movies. <laughs> Certainly he's going to do the thing that he set out to do, and he doesn't. He puts on the ring himself, and he's succumbed to the darkness. And yet, there comes Gollum, and Gollum has a battle with him at Mount Doom, eats his finger off, and with the finger comes the ring, and he slips and falls into Mount Doom. And so it was a weird you catastrophe. It was a catastrophic moment that uh, Frodo Baggins put on the ring and succumbed to darkness. And yet, there came a you catastrophe this good that took place, but it was through a weird circumstance, and all returned to joy, all returned to good as a result of the ring finally going in to Mount Doom. So a good story needs a catastrophe and a you catastrophe I've been thinking a lot about this, as I said, what makes for a good story. And I've been thinking about how Tolkien talks about this, and I've been thinking about how, well, it sort of depends on your vantage point what is a catastrophe and what is a you catastrophe? What's a good catastrophe? For instance, I'm a, I'm a bit of a sports fan, and this past week, there was certain devastating things that happened to the Seattle Seahawks football team last week. They lost against the Arizona Cardinals. Their first string, second string, and third string running backs all got injured, and they all went on injured reserve. They're gone for the rest of the season. There's a huge game happening tonight at 520 between the Seahawks and the 49ers. Whoever wins gets the first seed in the NFC, and they get a bye week, and they get home field advantage through the whole playoffs. And it felt like last week going into it that things were going well for the Seahawks. Oh, I'm a Seahawks fan, by the way. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> it felt like everything was going in the right direction last week. No, it felt so good uh, being a Seahawks fan. It felt good. And then we lost to the Cardinals. We lost all our running backs. And everything was going downhill and it was plunging. It was like it's the, the worst catastrophe that was happening, you know? And then on Monday, they signed Marshawn Lynch, who is the best running back in Seahawks history. From yeah, from Cal, lives in Oakland. <laughs> Amazing. And it felt like, uh oh, maybe this is the you catastrophe for the Seahawks that's going to happen. He's going to come back and win this game and it's going to be incredible. Now, that depends. Thank you. That depends on the vantage point from which you <laughs> are paying attention to this. If you're a Seahawks fan, this is the best thing that's ever happened, Marshawn Lynch coming back tonight and maybe winning a football game. But if you're a 49ers fan like all of you are, this is, this is the catastrophe, right? So vantage point, vantage point is interesting. When we think about in a story, is it good or is it bad? Is it catastrophe? Is it you catastrophe? Or even think about like, like in a story like Robin Hood. Stealing from the rich to give to the poor. Uh, the poor certainly need that, right? But if you're rich and having somebody steal from you, that doesn't feel like a good thing. That feels like the catastrophe. So perspective is interesting um, when it comes to this idea of the you catastrophe. I tell all these stories about stories because, uh, for those of you who didn't know, J.R.O. Tolkien was really good friends with a guy by the name of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is one of the most famous Christian writers of the 20th century. He was a prolific author. He wrote a lot of books. He wrote a lot of novels and fantasy stories, too. Chronicles of Narnia, Mere Christianity. These are great books for entry into the Christian story and learning more about what it means to follow Jesus. C.S. Lewis, though, became an atheist when he was 17. Uh, he then went off and fought in World War I. So did J.R.O. Tolkien. And that plunged him even deeper into a space of atheism in his life. And when he was in his 20s, C.S. Lewis, he, he had some sort of profound experiences after World War I in which he was in a hospital and some people convinced him that, that God did exist even in the midst of the darkness and the evil that they all experienced in that time of war. But he didn't have a sense of how Jesus fit into all of that, into his own faith journey, his own faith story. And so, as legend has it, on one afternoon, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and another friend of theirs were taking a walk through Oxford together, 
And C.S. Lewis kept telling Tolkien, I just don't get how Jesus fits into this larger story of who God is. I just don't get it. Tell me, tell me how you understand that. Tolkien was a lifelong Catholic, uh, and he was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And he says to C.S. Lewis, he says, C.S. Lewis, well, he probably didn't say that. He probably said Clive. He's probably calling by his first name, Clive. Here's the thing. The stories we love, the stories we write, always have a catastrophe and a you catastrophe in them. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the you catastrophe. It happens twice in the gospel stories. One, when Jesus is born, this is this incredible moment in which God of the universe comes into human flesh and takes on human flesh and becomes part of our own life story. For all the darkness that transpired before that, here we have a you catastrophe. We have light coming into humanity. And then as you go through the story further, there's another you catastrophe, or another catastrophe. Jesus dies on the cross. It all feels like darkness is lost. This good thing that happened is gone. But then three days later, Jesus rises from the grave. Another you catastrophe. Jesus' own life and ministry is framed by these two powerful events of the you catastrophe. God coming to humanity in flesh and God raising from dead. Jesus. These are amazing you catastrophes. So, Tolkien tells this to C.S. Lewis, and as I said, as legend has it, Lewis wasn't converted in that moment, but sometime the next day, he slept on it, he thought about it, and the Spirit spoke to him and said, I get it now. I get it now. Jesus is the central part of this whole thing of faith and life and following after God. Jesus is the you catastrophe. And for the first time, he could get a sense for him own self how God had entered into his own life story in that Jesus took on flesh and became a human. And as Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, rescues us. There was a sense in which there was rescue happening. Those two men had experiences in which they'd experienced a lot of catastrophe in their life, a lot, of, a lot of trauma as a result of their experiences of being part of a great war and other things that were really hard for them. And yet here was Jesus who was rescuing them, and not just them, but all of humanity, when Jesus took on flesh and blood to save us, to rescue us. This is the Christmas story. One aspect of the Christmas story is this great you catastrophe, Jesus taking on flesh, becoming a human, born to us on Christmas morning. I'm going to read Hebrews 2 to us, and then I'm going to ask you one more question before we wrap up our time together, okay? Listen to the end of Hebrews chapter 2 one more time. I think this is a wonderful text again from, from the message. It says this, Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then, when he came before God as a high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and Jesus would be able to help where help was needed. I love that line. I wonder if just for a moment you could talk to a person near you and just, just share one way in which you see um, through the birth, through the Christmas story, God entering into your life story. And if you can't answer that question, maybe how you would long to see God enter into your life story, Jesus entering into your own life story right now. That's a complex, hard question. Um, but just try it out. See if you're willing to just share. How do you see God entering into your life story as the scriptures tell us Jesus took on flesh and blood? Or do you long to see God enter into your own life story right now? So in one to two minutes, do that. And then we'll, we'll pray and we'll wrap up and we'll move on in our worship service today. So talk to your neighbors one more time.
All right, maybe just another 30 seconds, 30 seconds, and then I'll wrap us up in prayer. All right, thanks, thanks for sharing with those nearby. Sometimes in just verbalizing and externalizing an answer to a question, it takes a deeper root inside of us when we externalize. So thanks for trying that out today and trying a, a little something different today for our time with our sermon. Brothers and sisters, the Savior took on flesh and blood to rescue us, to help where help was needed. That's a gift of God to each and every one of us this Christmas season. Join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. God, thank you for you. Thank you that you love us, God. You love humanity so much so that you would send your one and only son to take on flesh and blood, not to, not to condemn us, but to free us, to rescue us from all that we might experience as evil in this world, as painful, as, as harmful, as the scriptures say, you came to help where help was needed. And though there may be different vantage points in which we could understand what that good news might mean for some people, it might mean a hard word for some here and there, but Lord, we trust that that is who you are, that you came to rescue, you came to redeem, and you came to help where help was needed. Thank you, God, for this Christmas season and for reflecting once again on what it means that Jesus was born we love you, Lord, and we lift up the rest of this time as we gather together and worship to you, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We rise now in body or spirit as we continue to worship, and the hymn number is, sorry, 95.
may be seated. So this is the way that God works through flesh and blood, through the incarnation, and that continues through us, the church, and so we give our offering to invest in the work of Jesus Christ in the flesh through his people. One thing I want you to know that's coming up by way of announcement, that is we have a congregational meeting, a brief one after worship to elect our um, nominating committee that raises up our officers for the new year and also to um, approve of Jim Grenand extending for a year on session. So just know that that's coming up. So let's give now to the work of God's kingdom in the church. That was awesome. <clears throat> Thank you for this. For our prayers for the people, each one of you needs one little piece of paper and something to write with. And I've got two wonderful helpers right here <laughs> next to me, Carol and Allison are going to make sure that you get a piece of paper. This is just for you, but you want to have something to write with. Yeah. 
Yeah. We're on the brink of 2020. Isn't that wild? 2020. So I want you to think about this year ahead and what your prayer is for this year. And thinking for yourself and your own life, thinking for perhaps even uh, beyond that, the life of this country, the life of the world. But what I'm going to ask you to do in just a moment is to write your prayer, what your hope is a year from now, at the end of December 2020, what would you ask of God to be true? And before you write that, I want us to think together. One of the great things about being in worship together is that we remember how great God is. You just heard that in the song that uh, Jim and Karen sang. Mary, did you know who Jesus was, this baby you gave birth to, that he was the great I am? You heard it in the scriptures that he is the rescuer, he is our savior, he is the presence of God with us. We heard it in the earlier scriptures. God is a creator. God is a rescuer. So thinking of how great God is and looking out unto 2020, one of my favorite books that I got as a gift was from Heidi, and the title of it is The Future is Bigger Than the Past by Samuel Wells. And she said it's about how the deliverance of God is always greater than what we imagine. It's always greater than what's already happened. And so as we look out on 2020, this year being an awesome year isn't going to be necessarily about who becomes president. It's about who God is. So we sit here in the beginning of this year and we tap into this promise of who God is. And so we pray. So I want you to write a couple of things, and I, you're going to hang on to this, and I want you to put it somewhere where you're going to see it at the end of December 2020, okay? So take a moment and write what your prayer is for yourself, what you hope for a year from now will be true, and give that to God, what you hope for for yourself and for this world. And try not to be so broad that you say world peace, but something that is really measurable for you in a year, okay? So take just a moment. You can keep writing while I'm praying, and I'm going to lead us in prayer. But God, we praise you that you are the creator of all things, that you have created everything in your love, and that you have come in the midst of our own self-made catastrophes, and you have brought in Jesus Christ a you catastrophe, a new creation. 
that is always being birthed and is always greater than what we can possibly ask or imagine. We praise you for your people, the church, that it is your way to be present, to be present with us in the places where we just assume you are not, in our pain, in our weakness, in our failure, in our despair, in our depression. You are there. You are near. And you are able to lift and bring a new day so, Lord, we bring to you those things that feel hopeless in our own lives, in our own families, in our own country, in our world, grateful that you are the way, the truth, the resurrection and the life, the light that shines in the darkness, and we ask that we will be a people who live out your way and truth and life. That we move like you to the places of pain, to the places of weakness, to stand with those who need the support and the solidarity of your love in the flesh. We lift to you this year and every single thing we have written down. And we ask, O oh God, that we would see and experience your miracles. And by the end of this next year, that we would see your answers to prayer and we would be your answers to prayer. Thank you that you see us and you hear us and you love us and you save us. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As the Christmas season is nearly over, uh, we have poinsettias up here on the platform. Please take a poinsettia home. So some people took them home on Christmas Eve, but if you would like to have one, please take them. Um, otherwise, I don't know what will happen to them later this week. So <laughs> please take them, okay? If they could bring some joy into your home, please take one with you. And if you put an ornament on the tree this year too, please take that with you as well as we'll be taking down some of the decorations inside of the sanctuary later this week. And now go with this benediction. May you go with the grace of God the Father, the love of Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>